so thankful that all of you have decided to join us for worship today. We've concentrated all of our childish ways right here in the front. All right. It's going to be great. We're going to have a wonderful special by our patch club today. It's going to be just a wonderful opportunity to hear from them in the house of the Lord today. Uh, we're going to open up in prayer and I'm going to ask uh, Brother Luke to come and open us up in prayer. And um, I'm going to try to get some people uh, involved uh, doing some things. And uh, so uh, it's great to have Brother Luke he and his wife, Catherine, have just been a huge blessing to us and so thankful to have you all as a part of our fellowship. You come and open us in prayer, brother. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for Sundays when we can get together as a church family. We get to worship you. We get to open our hearts and our minds and learn about you and just grow in our Christian walk. Lord, this morning we thank you for all the mothers who are here and who those who can't be here. Lord, thank you for this special day that we can just remember them and all the work uh, that they do. Lord, most of us wouldn't be here um, without our moms and how they've guided us um, and directed our lives. Lord, just this morning, I pray that each mom would feel special uh, and that we would take care of them well today. Lord, be with the rest of the service. Be with the kids as they sing for us. Just help them to... Uh, um, do well and be a blessing. Lord, and just help us to learn something new this morning. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Right. Yes. 228, 228 in your hymnal, you find your place. Let's stand as we sing. 228. I love to tell the story. 228. today is going to come from the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 23, and it's uh, of course on this day and at this time that we would like to recognize the mothers who are among us, and so if you are a mom, um, if you'd like to raise your hand, I'm sure you do not want to stand, I know people don't uh, really like that, and so if uh, you just want to raise your hand, and this is any kind of mom, if you're a mom, a grandmom, a mama, a mommy, if you are a foster mom, uh, if you are anyone that goes by the name of mom, mother-in-laws, don't count. I will draw the line right there. You know, hopefully it works out for you. Uh, but no, I'm just kidding. If you're a mother-in-law, I guess, you know, that means at some point you're a mother. And so... <laughs> You're welcome. And so, no, we, we do want to take a special time to uh, say thank you. And we have a gift for you. And so if you'll keep your hands up, um, we'll make sure that we, uh, our, our gentleman here will get around to provide a special token of our thanks and appreciation. And so <laughs> raise a little higher there, Angie. We want to make sure we get you there. doesn't matter what Jacob thinks. <laughs> Everyone's embarrassed by their mama, all right, until they need money. <laughs> It's, we laugh because it's true. It's, it's, it's not so much of a joke. It's actually, our choir is made up of mothers. <laughs> There's more mothers than there are anybody else, Quincy. <clears throat> I will say that, indeed, uh, motherhood, from what I've observed, 
is quite the challenge. Now I know I have a front row seat to two mothers, my mother as she raised me and then my wife who's raising our children and I pitch in every once in a while but the truth is um, motherhood is a challenge. The things that you go through and what you are called upon to do and it's, uh, it's, it's times like these that we want to say thank you but I hope that we will do what we need to do to give thanks to you these special mothers every day of your lives and indeed God has called you you to be their mother regardless of what you may think about how good a job you are doing or are not doing it seems but God is using you and your unique personality your experiences and your view on life to shape and direct these young precious people to be the person that God wants them to be and we know that without your formative experiences and your influences and the times where you <clears throat> direct children to do what they need to do those long yes amen those long hours I'll tell you you know I saw one woman um, she made a video she says you know I'm going to start sleeping on my husband's side of the bed because apparently on that side of the bed it is impossible to hear the children's cr uh, cry in the middle of the night <laughs> And uh, I can affirm that's true. That is absolutely true. Mothers, you do things that um, <clears throat> men may be reluctant to do. So we thank you for that. And we'll read here from Proverbs chapter 23. And I'll just read a couple of verses. Beginning in verse 22. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Buy the truth, and sell it not. Also, wisdom, and instruction, and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bare thee shall rejoice. I hope it is the desire of every child's heart to let their mother's heart rejoice. There is a tendency, as we get older especially, and as we um, believe we know everything there is to know, that when our mothers provide us gentle instruction, or not so gentle instruction, we have a tendency to despise that wisdom. <laughs> The thing that every teenager hates to hear is, you know, I was a teenager once. For some reason, they don't believe us. Yep, we were just born at the age of 40. That's it, we just came out bald and overweight. That's just, that's just how God made us. Believe it or not, we were there once, and as hard as that is to identify with, we do have, and especially mothers, who put in a lot of work and care and consideration and can remember everything they've experienced in their life with incredibly vivid contrast, pour their lives into their children. But sometimes we just rent the truth from mom. Well, we have an option to buy, but it seems too expensive. The writer here says, buy the truth and sell it not. The truth in your home is a rent-to-own program. There is truth that you may be required to receive and do and fulfill. But the idea is that you'll see the value of that truth, despite the flaws of the imperfect people sharing that with you. Your mother and your father are, have bought into some truth, the truth of God's Word, and are doing their best to impart that truth and wisdom and instruction and understanding, because we want to look at our children and say, I can greatly rejoice, because there's a child that has bought the truth and sold it not. Here's the mother that, that bought bore them and she can say today I rejoice and hopefully just as Proverbs chapter 31 says that your children children will arise and call you blessed and it is our goal as we expend our lives and as we watch the mothers in our life expend their lives and energies and fortunes to invest in them let me encourage you especially ladies keep pouring out your hearts we need it we need what you have. We need the grace. We need the wisdom. We need your instruction and counsel. And we look forward to that. And we desire for you to share that with us 
and with our children. So today we thank you for all you do to help everyone in your family. Let's pray. Father, we glorify you for the gift of mothers. We're so thankful, Lord, that in your wisdom you have brought a woman into the home and into this earth and to, and, and to the lives of so many people. We're so thankful for how you've crafted them in such a way to be so patient and loving and encouraging. And Lord, I know that patience can wear thin, and I know that not every day is a good day. But Lord, I am so grateful for the mothers of this church who have invested in so many lives. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to guide them in, their, in, in your truth and give them wisdom and guide them as they instruct their little ones, even the ones that don't seem so little anymore, to gain understanding that we may all rejoice in your truth and glorify you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's enjoy this special from our choir today. Let's stand as we sing. Three, five, five.
refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. To thy prince the spies forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Wonderful. Thank you. you. May be seated as we enjoy this special from our patch club this morning. to give to someone special, so be prepared for that as they come down. All right, let's awesome. go get a flower. Wasn't that the cutest thing?
as our parade of children goes around, I believe they'll head out to Junior Church. And the rest of us here will turn to Matthew chapter 15. We're going to read verses 21 through 28. We good? Okay. Matthew chapter 15. Now, I will say that I know that um, Mother's Day for some um, is a complex day, that it's not always... It's not always a day of celebration for everyone, and we want to be sensitive to that. And it can be complex for a number of reasons. And um, uh, I just want you to know if that's if that's you, I'm praying for you. And um, I hope that uh, as we go through this, that uh, as we see in the text, we'll see what it is about this woman that we'll see in particular, but what it is about her faith that will encourage all of us, women as well, mothers certainly, uh, but all of us, no matter what it is that we may be uh, struggling with or wrestling with uh, as well. And so um, I do want to just be an encouragement there. I, I joked with myself because this won't shock some of you, I often talk with myself. And as I was making my own jokes over my coffee this morning, I said, you know, this, I may study for this message more than I study for any other message. Because a man has to get up here and not look like he's telling women what to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, see, some of you, there's the nervous laugh, there's the giggle, there's the, oh no, what's he getting ready to do? Well, we'll see. But I think uh, uh, as challenging as this may be, um, I'm, I'm delighted to be able to share the scriptures. This thing is in my foot spot. Yes, that sounds weird. You don't know what I do back here. I've got to have my foot up on the pulpit. You're welcome. Now you have the behind the scenes tour. All right. Now I'm comfortable. I had to move my little box out of the way. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 15. We're going to begin reading verse number 21. And the scriptures tell us here. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the sea coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered, Wait, he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And my message this morning for Mother's Day is entitled, The Perseverance of a Woman of Great Faith. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise for your goodness and grace that you've given to us. And we thank you again for the love that we receive from you and that we receive from you through the many mothers that we've come to know in our lives. And Father, I pray that as we examine your text that you'll give us wisdom, help us to make wise and discerning application. And God, help us to be encouraged to persevere in our faith and to be encouraged to continue to pray. And it's in Jesus' name we do pray these things. Amen. One of the greatest developments in manufacturing is robots. Does anyone here have a, have a robot, a little robot in their house? Yeah? Okay. We're, some of us are starting to live like the Jetsons envisioned so long ago. We have a little robot in our house. We have one here in our church. No, I'm not, I'm not pointing to Ms. Charlene. Okay. There's a little robot right over there, and uh, it works when it wants to. I've named it Karen. <laughs> After my mother-in-law, not after the memes, <laughs> though sometimes I, I wonder, <laughs> you know, it's because um, when I poke when I poke its buttons, it uh, it gets angry at me and it beeps, 
uh, and it works when it wants to. And so it's affectionately known as Karen in my life. If you have some passive aggressive anger you need to get out, you'd name it whatever you like, and that's totally fine. But I will tell you, as we look at robots, why do we buy them? Why do we have them here? What makes them so beneficial to us, those of us that have them? Well, they put in endless hours. They function in different environments. They never seem to run down. They cost very little to maintain. And they do it all without praise or personal attention. Now, if you haven't already drawn the parallel, that's just like our wives. No, gentlemen, your wife is not a robot. You say, man, that's a good investment. Is there any way that we can just kind of carbon copy that? Not the point, my friends. Mothers put in endless hours. They function dynamically. They never seem to run out of energy, though we, we know they do. And they do it all, sadly, from time to time, without the praise that they deserve. Now, it's been said that men want to improve the world, but mothers want to improve their families. Now, I honestly think that's the harder job of the two. Now, we see in our text here the heart of just such a woman, a woman whose, whose name is not given or else we would call her that. This woman comes to Jesus looking for help for her daughter. And from her, we learn what it means to be a woman or a person of great faith. And we know, reading once again in verses 21 through 23, that women face harrowing problems. And here's the problem that was facing this dear woman. We read again, Then Jesus went thence and departed unto or into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. But he answered her, not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. Now here in these verses we are introduced to our leading lady, a Canaanite of the region of Tyre and Sidon, a Canaanite by name, and that's a general term that means that she was a pagan, a Greek. She was from an area of the world that was once the promised land given to Israel that Joshua was told to conquer in his day. Now, no sooner does she come on the scene that she cries out to Jesus. And I, I want you to understand the artistry of this language. It's apparent in the original, but it appears ordinary in English. Because it says here that she cries out. But this cry is more of a bellow. It's deep. It's guttural. It's a cry of lament. Mark's gospel adds that he or that she besought Jesus. It means there's a request that is urgent and fervent. She's choking back the words as she tries to put into language what she's feeling when it comes to her daughter. She's trying to muster up the courage to take what's in her heart and mind and, and almost through words it's an admission, a recognition of what's actually taking place, what was once just within herself now has to come out in the open. She has to gutturally, deeply from her bowels relay to Jesus what it is that's taking place. And, and even the word itself indicates that there would be a, a tinge of anger. She's upset that this is even happening in the first place. And you can sense that if you were sitting there on that dusty trail through Tyre and Sidon listening to this woman as she speaks, you would sense her grief as she relays the story of what's happened to her daughter. Her daughter is being grievously tormented by a demon. And who could blame her for feeling the way she feels, for experiencing this mix of anger and compassion and, and urgency and, and, de and depth of feeling? 
could blame her. She is a first-hand witness, a front-row seat to the cruelty that this demon is, is inflicting upon her. This severely oppressed child is right there in her home day after day being afflicted. In fact, the word vexed is, is, gives us the idea that this woman is, is noting the torment that's riddling her daughter's body physically. The torment that's taking place is, is a malady of some kind, a physical illness, and she doesn't have to imagine what's going on with her daughter. It's not a story she heard from one of the gals down the road. It's right there. And I imagine that as this young daughter is suffering with a high fever, that this mother is also struggling through anxious hours of crisis. Now surely, this mother had other problems. All moms do. And moms today are certainly no strangers to difficulty. I was told, or I saw uh, a one woman relay some of the challenges that moms face. And she said this, no mom has all five of these things. A clean car, a clean house, no laundry, shaved legs, sanity. If you don't have all five, <clears throat> you get to pick. Now, we may joke about that. Some of us. Those of us insensitive chauvinist men, apparently. But we all have problems. But what problem compares to your child suffering right before your eyes? The most distressing of all parental problems is the devil's attack on our children. There's nothing that will bring out the protective side of a mother more than a threat against her child. If you want to see Mama Bear come out, go after the kids. Amen. Because to a parent, all problems seem small when their children are at stake. Now this woman comes to Jesus in full faith and confidence. And blessed is the woman who knows where to take her problems. And based on our reading of uh, verse number 22, we know that this woman believed everything there was to believe about Jesus. She believed that he was the Lord, the promised son of David, the Messiah. She fully believed and had total confidence. From this woman's lips comes the word Lord, a title used only by his disciples to this point, and most recently used by those disciples to affirm their full belief that Jesus is God's anointed son. And as she utters that great title of Lord, she calls to our mind Jesus' very divinity. He is God in the flesh. So she comes to Jesus knowing that he has the power and the interest to answer her request for mercy. Have mercy on me. But she's Greek. And she's using Jewish terminology. And Jewish terminology with a Greek accent must have sounded odd to the disciples. When she approaches Jesus as the son of David, she was definitely putting herself on Jewish ground. But she wasn't allowed to do that because she was a Gentile. Now, of course, the title is indicative of her faith. It reveals that she really believes that Jesus is the Messiah. He really is the son of David. That's really who he is. But since she came to him on Jewish terms, he was silent. Verse 23, Jesus answered her, not a word, the text tells us. Even an appeal based on Jesus' lordship and messianic appearance could not help her because the timing was not appropriate. The gospel is sent first to the Jews. The Gentiles would be an audience at a later time. Now certainly Jesus knew her heart, but his silence encouraged her to continue asking. Silence from God is not a reprimand to resent. It is a challenge to undertake. Silence from God is not a reprimand to resent. It is a challenge 
have to undertake. The challenge is to endure the silence with reverent, peaceful stillness. Stillness before God. It's a discipline to be developed, not a burden to begrudge. Stillness is the absence of fear, the trembling, the apprehension, distress. It melts away like an ice cube under a running faucet. When God is present, fear is banished like the kiss of mist over a tranquil lake. The presence of God cools and calms the fearful mind. Silence can be oppressive. And it can weigh heavily on us. But silence, in a strange plot twist, provides strength to continue. Well, where do I derive that from? Isaiah chapter number 30 and verse 15 connects silence before God with strength from God. It is not the only text that does this, but it is one of the most clear. Isaiah tells us in this chapter, in that verse, For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. In quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. Silence before God brings strength from God. We are challenged by God Himself to be still, to be silent, and to be strong. He will give us strength as we are still before Him. This simple act of silence from the Lord was, was there to, demonstra- or to encourage her to demonstrate her faith. It, it wasn't encouraging her to come in a wordy fret, but it's challenging her to really develop and deepen her faith. In the meantime, the disciples broke the silence through their impatience. They were impatient with her persistent following and crying out. And the disciples said, send her away. Ugh. Now, to be fair to the disciples, which we'll give them a pass, they could mean, well, give her what she wants and just get rid of her. Or they could just simply mean just get rid of her. In either case, they certainly weren't showing compassion for her or for her demonized daughter. What's interesting, and what I even was confused over myself, is that Jesus, in his reply, was not speaking to the woman. He is replying to his disciples in verse number 24, without even a glance to the woman. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Without a glance towards this woman, Jesus answered the disciples. And Jesus is reminding them that he was sent only to the nation of Israel, those lost sheep that were his primary audience. There was no need for him to send the woman away because she wasn't even eligible in the first place. He had come to offer his own people the kingdom promised to them through David centuries before. It would be inappropriate for him to bring the blessings on the Gentiles before the blessings fell to Israel. But the woman was not so easy easily discouraged. She saw in Jesus the only chance for help for her child. And on her knees, she pleads, the simple Lord, help me. Verse 25, then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. The idea of worshiping being a prostrate position. She fell before him in complete humility and adoration and simply said, help me, Lord, help me. Now, Jesus' reply caused her to realize her position because he said it would not be right to take the children's bread and give it to the dogs, which is what he said in verse number 26. He's picturing a family gathered at mealtime around a table, eating the food that's provided by the head of the household. And the Gentile woman 
interestingly enough, saw herself in this picture, not as someone sitting around the table, not as a child of the family of Israel, but someone that was just a household dog. I want you to understand that some people in this time, such as the Pharisees and other uh, incredulous Jewish people, would use the term dog, but a different word in their language that would simply mean uh, street dogs, the curs, the mutts that would run around town and eat garbage. But Jesus uses a different word entirely, a family pet. How many of you have a dog? I bet you love that dog. But that dog loves you. I know. I know how I talk to my dogs. I kiss the kids goodbye. Hey, I'll see you later. See you later. Oh, Zeta, you're such a good girl. Oh, I love you so much. I oh, you're such a good All right. See you later, honey. Bye. I love you. Zeta, I'll miss you so much. Okay, thank you. Come here. Oh, do you want to go for a walk? Do you want to go for a walk? Oh, I said the word. I said the word. That's right. That's right. Let's go play. You get excited. It's a household dog. You call the dog. You beckon the dog over to you. Jesus is using a word that says, I want you to come, but I need you to learn this lesson first. You're a Gentile. You're not excluded, but you're not first. But let's see if you're persistent enough to claim the blessing. And she picks up on this, her persistence after her plea, Lord, help me. She, she uses the Messianic title, but that, that, that didn't work. She calls out to him as Lord, and, and it's, it's this plea. It's this plea that she's going to continue with. She will not be deterred. It's, it's a certain word with great emotional emphasis. When she says, help me, she says, God, I am downtrodden and oppressed. I am at my wits end. I am so desperate for help. I am in greatest need for you. This isn't just an annoyance to be relieved. It's not just a burden to be lifted. It's I am completely squashed under the enormity of this problem. And if you don't help me, there is no chance of being helped. I believe she captures the spirit of the psalmist as recorded in chapter 86 and verse 17, where the psalmist exclaims in his own words, hope in me, which is a unique word. But let's read it from the text. Show me a token for good, the psalmist says, that they which hate me may see it and be ashamed. Because thou, Lord, hast hope in me and comforted me. And that interesting word there means, take hold of me, pick me up. I'm in danger of being stuck right here unless you do something to help. Ladies, have you ever felt like you've just been stuck and you're pleading for help? And truly, nobody else understands. As much as a husband may want to understand, there are times where we just don't. And you know it too. <laughs> we wish we could. But there's only one that can really pick you up from where you're stuck. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. This woman's faith was great, as Jesus labeled it, because she persisted in asking and trusting when everything else seemed to be completely against her. Now, it, to put it in first century understanding, her race was against her. She was a Gentile. Her gender, even then, was against her, because most Jewish rabbis paid little attention to women. They had very low standing in that culture. And it seems like even the disciples were against her. And if we misread what Jesus is doing, it may even seem as though Jesus was against her. But all of these obstacles only made her persist in asking. Jesus is not against her. And his reply to call her a dog, that, that beloved pet, that little pet dog, not the filthy mutts that are all out there eating the garbage, is, is her, his way of drawing her in. He, he wasn't playing games with her, and he's not playing games with you. He's not trying to make the situation more difficult. He's drawing her and every one of us into a growing response of faith. 
and her own replies showed that she was growing in her faith and unwilling to let him go without getting an answer. Our leading lady immediately seized on Jesus' illustration about the children's bread that we read again here in verse number 26. It is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And in verse 27, she picks up on this. And I, I can almost hear the, the levity in her voice as she sees herself in this illustration and getting closer to that reward of her faith. Truth, Lord! Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. She says, yeah, I may be a dog, but I'm no street dog. I'm your beloved pet, and I see it. I see myself in that house, in your house. And you are the bread of life, Lord. And if I could just get a crumb. Isn't amazing the faith of women throughout the New Testament? A man wants the whole mantle, but a woman says, if I could just touch the hem of the garment, everything will be just fine. Jesus tries to get men to understand that, that is, his disciples, and say, you just need the faith of a mustard seed. If you just take the hem of the garment, if you just take a crust of bread, you'd get everything that you need. What a tremendous testimony of faith and example that these persistent women are to all of us. Now keep in mind that our Lord responded to this woman as He did, not to destroy her faith, but to develop it. See, just like resistance bands are used to help strengthen muscles, so does dialogue with Jesus. It stimulates our growth. Samuel Rutherford, a pastor of old time, said this, It is faith's work to claim and challenge loving kindness out of all the roughest strokes of God. What he's saying is what George Mueller tried to capture in his own statement. Prayer is not overcoming God's reluctance. It is laying hold of God's willingness. He wants to help you. But part of what helps all of us is for our faith to be developed. You know, there are times in our own household where we can tell our children what they should do. And if they don't do it, if they don't understand it, or if it would just get done better, faster, we do it ourselves. But does that help their growth? Does that help their development? Does that increase their responsibility? No. Does it get the job done? Yes, right now. But it doesn't really get the job done of parenting, training, teaching, coaching, guiding. We just wanted it done. So we shortchange their development. Jesus is not willing to shortchange our spiritual development by shortcutting our answer to prayer. He wants to nurture and develop that faith, and He's willing to see just how persistent you and I are willing to be to get it. Can we endure silence? Can we endure the dialogue, the confusing verse He lays on our heart that doesn't seem to make sense? How, how am I supposed to do this, Lord? Can you endure the silence and the dialogue in order to persevere through the challenge? When you wonder if there's any grace left over for you, if there's just a crumb of grace that would perhaps fall from the table, Christian mothers, let me assure you, there is an inexhaustible supply of God's grace at your disposal. Paul asserted this very thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9, where he said that God's grace is sufficient for thee, for his strength is made perfect in weakness. In the book, The Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan, 
the one of the characters there is named Christina. And Christina is on her own pilgrimage with a young pilgrim following her named Mercy. And the children are in tow and they're all pictured knocking at a particular door called the Wicker Gate. And they knock and they knock and no one answers. You think anyone's home? But you try knocking. I don't know. I can't get through. And then they start to hear the dogs, ferocious dogs, chihuahuas. Okay, they, those things will kill you faster than a, do, uh, than a Doberman, okay? And yet we, that's the real concealed carry, right? You put a chihuahua in your purse and no one will mess with you. 45? No. That's for chumps. But a chihuahua, no one's going to mess with you. And if they win, they just have to take it home. So you can keep your purse and your chihuahua, ladies. <laughs> They hear ferocious dogs come barking, and they and they, they say, "Well, what am I supposed to do? If I keep barking, the dogs are going to come." And I hear their their loud barks getting louder and louder and louder. And here they come, and and they know that we we could be trespassing. If they get to us, they're going to absolutely slaughter us. But I've got to get through. The, the the gatekeeper, the master of this door, has to come. We're knocking for him. We're intensely knocking. What should we do? And they're knocking and they're knocking. They decide to just keep knocking and knocking. And all of a sudden. The master opens the gate and the barking stops. We all have, metaphorically speaking, the barking dogs in our life. The things that are trying to deter us from persevering in prayer to speak to the Lord and endure the silence and the dialogue and the, and the, and the, and the lack of understanding of the, the time schedule that the Lord has us on. The, to find, uh, despite grappling, to find acceptance with the timeline that He's determined for us. When is He going to open this door? How long? long do I have to keep knocking? The dogs, the dogs are coming. They're all around. They're all around me. And then he answers because we persevered. Ladies, you may always have your detractors. Persevere. Persevere. And by the way, when someone insists that you're stubborn, you just tell them you're going to persevere. That's your new word. Now, both silence and correction are used by God to develop our faith, not destroy it. All that remains is for us to accept the challenge. A woman certainly has heroin problems, but she can be a heroine in prayer. A woman of great faith is a woman of great persistence. And a woman of great persistence is a woman of great prayer. It's faith and faith only that Jesus acknowledged. We have no idea what she looked like. No scale to identify her beauty. We know nothing about the quality of her work or her assessment of her own work. We don't know about her standing among her peers. We don't know anything about that. But we do know this, that this woman's daughter was healed because she had great faith. And great faith is what brought the response from Jesus Christ. Ladies, your kids need you. I will also say this, your husbands need you. We need you. We need your love. We need your loving presence. We need your steadfast support. More than we may be willing to admit. But above all, we need your persistent prayers. Your knocking on that divine door may be the one thing that gets us all through. I don't know where dad was in the story, but I know where he wasn't. Mom, we need you. Foster mom, we need you. Stepmom, we need you. Mom in law, well, let's just stop right there. Starting to get ahead of myself. We need you, ladies. We need you. I'll close with one story, and I'll let you get to your Mother's Day meal. I read a story about a man 
whose parents were, were just ardent practitioners of prayer. And as he reflected on his childhood, he was, he was impressed by their devotions, their devotion to the Lord, and, and not, not just an act or a ritual, but when they really had a problem, he would often hear his parents say, well, you know, we just need to pray about that. And as he grew older, of course, the nature of the problems always become more complex and concerns change. But whenever he voiced a doubt or fear, he remembered his mother just saying, well, we, we better pray about that. And they made it a habit over time to just have a little place where they would meet. And for them, it was what we would think of as a, as a coat rack, a place where just right there at the door, and you would hang your coat or your hat up on it. And theirs was a little bit wider. It had a little base right down there at the bottom, and they said it was just, it was just the right size and just the right little spot. Before we ventured out for the day, we could just meet with God and meet with one another and pray. Just a simple prayer, not a long prayer, not an arduous prayer, not a complex or check-in-the-box prayer, but just a place to pray. And in his own words, he said, that spot became a place of miracles. It became a place of miracles. So I will ask you, where is your place of miracles where you meet with God and carry the challenges and burdens and problems of your family to the Lord to ask for the miraculous to happen. We learn a lot from this woman. She was a woman of great faith because she was a woman of great persistence. And she was a woman of great persistence because she was a woman of great prayer. Whatever you are facing today, be persistent, but be in prayer. Let's all stand to our feet. As we take this opportunity to reflect on what the Lord has spoken to us about, I invite you, whether in your seat or at the altar, to consider how the Lord is leading you to be a person of faith, to give praise to your wife or to your mother, or to be encouraged as you do find yourself carrying the burdens that you have to the Lord. Be encouraged. God always rewards great faith. And He always blesses those who are persistent in prayer. Endure. Endure through the silence and dialogue, and God will bless you. As the piano plays, take this opportunity to speak to the Lord. We thank you for your love and the access that we have to you through Jesus Christ. And we're so thankful for the gift of prayer. And we're even so grateful that you answer our prayer. God, help us to pray, to persevere. Give us the grace we need to endure these times of challenge in our lives. And be glorified as we praise you, as we experience the greatness of your grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. All right, a few announcements today. Um, this, uh, not this Sunday, um, at the end of this month, we're going to have our fifth Sunday fellowship, and um, we're continuing on that, and that's, uh, of course, our, our fellowship and our potluck in the afternoon uh, immediately following our services, and that is also the day that we are going to begin our new schedule uh, for 
our uh, trial schedule of services. And you can see that down there um, at the bottom of your bulletin. We'll start at 9 a.m. with uh, our Bible study. Um, that's the evening service, cut and paste right into the 9 a.m. slot. And uh, that'll be followed by a time of uh, refreshments. And we're actually, we're actually tweaking that a little bit. Um, words have meaning. And so I'm going to leave that as refreshments, but we're working on something a little bit more hearty. Okay. And um, you're welcome. Actually, you can thank Sam and Tommy. And so uh, that after that uh, time of refreshments, we will uh, continue to take a look here at uh, the 1015 time, which is going to start uh, our discipleship time. Uh, a lot of people call that Sunday school. Some people think Sunday school is just for little kids. And so I want to make sure everyone knows everyone, everyone knows that that's for all ages and stages of life. And then 11 o'clock will be our service our 11 a.m. service just like we have now and nothing changes there and I want to emphasize that each service is unique uh, the message that I preach at 9 a.m. is not going to be the same as 11 it's not a carbon copy and so we want to encourage everyone to take advantage of each of these opportunities uh, to come so you'll see for example uh, right now in the evening services at 6 we're going through a study of redemption God saves sinners is the title of my series through the book of of Isaiah. And we're going to take that and just put it at 9 a.m. and continue to do that study. Currently the adults are studying church history at uh, 10 a.m. which will become, well it's basically 10.15 now because we eat breakfast. And so we'll still eat and have a good time there and then begin the actual teaching around 10.15. And then as you've noticed, uh, predominantly we go through the book of Matthew on Sunday mornings and we'll continue through that series. So I, let me just encourage you, take advantage of every Every opportunity, because every service is a unique opportunity for you to hear from God's Word, to draw closer to Him, and have an experience that helps you to be more like Jesus Christ. And so, the more that you do that, um, I believe the the better uh, the better your spiritual life will continue. And so, I uh, want to make a note of that there. That's all happening on May uh, happening on May 29th. You'll see the other services that we have coming up, and uh, just a few other things here. The marriage. Enrichment morning, which was about a week ago, a little over a week ago now. Um, some people have asked if we could do that again as kind of a, a makeup day. And so I've gone ahead and scheduled that for October 15th, which none of you will remember, which is fine because it's already in the app, it's already updated there. And so here's the deal if you came to this one, you don't have to come to the next one. I guess technically you don't have to come to any of them. But that being said, America, okay? Um, that being being said, uh, I'm taking the material and the information that I shared in this last Marriage Enrichment Morning and just kind of doing a, a makeup session uh, there. So if you missed it and uh, you want to be a part of that, go ahead and put that on your calendar or just keep checking the app. And uh, that's going to be in October. And uh, so I um, want to make that uh, available to everybody. And uh, let me see, the Young Adult Life Group is meeting this Saturday, the 14th, at the Schoenweiss's house. At least that's the plan for now. And, um, hi. Oh, I, I, I was told this two hours ago. A lot happens. Are you, you going to go buy a new gun that day? Is that because that's. No. Hold him to that. Oh, it's not because of you? Ooh, 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 gossip. What? Next Sunday after the morning service, we're all going to go out. This is why I don't print out a calendar anymore, people, okay? You know, because two hours of your life makes all the difference. Well, the 15th, Sunday afternoon, thus saith the mat, and so that's going to be great. And so um, that's the plan until it's not the plan anymore, okay? And let me make sure I'm not missing anything here, or something's changed. I'm sure someone will tell me. The only other thing that I'll, I'll let everyone be aware of is that as we approach this um, uh, May 29th uh, date, we are making some slight uh, tweaks to the children's ministry, which uh, when we get those finalized, it's it's nothing catastrophic. The times are all the same um, and, and all that. But just a little, uh, a couple of tweaks to make sure that as the children come, they are not just sitting somewhere for three hours and hating life. And so we're really trying to, I mean, we might as well be honest. And so we're really trying to make sure that there's variety, diversity, and unity across all three services. And so we're continuing to work that. And um, when we get those finalized, I'll make sure that we fill everyone in. But 
Uh, I say that to assure you we're thinking about your kids, and we want this to be a substantive and meaningful time of spiritual formation for them as well. Okay. Anything else? Changes? Addendums? Provisos? Caveats? Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for how you nurture us in our faith and encourage us and challenge us. God, I pray that as we draw closer to you today, that we would do those things which glorify you and help us, Lord, to pay special praise to our wives and mothers and to encourage them and to give them thanks for all that you've done in their life and how you, use, how you have used them in our lives as well. God, bring us back tonight. Help us to be refreshed and help us to be prepared to further study your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you later.